Republican minority leader is our guest tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. State Representative Patricia Morgan has broken through a, uh, you know, another glass ceiling. She is the minority leader for the Republican Party. Of course, the old joke that the Providence Journal ripped off for me last week and actually this past weekend in their editorial uh, about the phone booth. I mean, she only leads 11 people, including herself. But nonetheless, it is a formidable accomplishment, and she will join us coming up a little bit later on in the broadcast. So welcome in. It is nice to have you aboard, as always. Let's go to the rundown and see what's happening out there. Yeah, look who's coming to dinner. Was that Sidney Poitier? I think so. Well, this is Mitt Romney instead. Uh, private dinner amidst all of the internal combustion of the Romney Trump controversy, the folks who are acting out, Kellyanne Conway, who seemingly uh, can't get inside uh, the, the most important meetings on this. And so she felt like she had to, as we chronicled yesterday over the weekend, had to speak to the president-elect about how much pushback is coming on this appointment via television, which is, by the way, something she did often during the campaign. you got to give her credit. She may be the single-handed MVP of the Trump campaign, but it looks like she might be on the way out. Anyway, uh, big meeting, and Trump loves it. It's clearly uh, just based on all the feedback that, that you're getting inside, outside, and those who say they've got off-the-record information close to the campaign, that the president-elect loves the drama around this. It's still kind of hard to put together in some ways. In some ways, you think Romney would be a soothing choice for the world, so we'll see what happens. Uh, in the meantime, there are a couple other appointments. This is the stuff that you've got to do. Uh, Lane Chow is headed for Transportation Secretary, and uh, Representative Tom Price to lead uh, Health and Human Services, uh, reportedly very competent people, and so that should give you some good feeling as well. But, of course, Donald Trump can't stop with the tweets, including kicking in on flag burning last night. With all that's going on, does he have like ADD or something? Why? It's like, guys, listen, I know we got a whole big discussion going on on the Secretary of State thing, but I got a tweet on it. I think it's just something we're going to have to get used to uh, because it doesn't seem to be stopping, and there's no indication that it will. All right, let's come home here and talk a little bit just for a second on what's happening with this UHIP thing. UHIP is going to become an acronym that is going to be household if they don't figure this whole thing out fast. The headlines here. Uh, lawmakers spent hours yesterday literally beating the tar out of the administration, the Raimondo administration, over this whole UHIP thing. This is the state computer program contracted with the Deloitte company that brings you one-stop shopping for all your human services needs, and uh, it's got problems. And the former lieutenant governor and high-ranking administration person, Elizabeth Roberts, uh, is in the midst of all this. We have Deloitte working. Uh, we keep having them bring new resources to Rhode Island, uh, bring more strength. You know, we talked about training today. Bring more people to help us train. You know, get more people on the ground in the field offices. So, we have a history of working with them. We have some issues with the system, and we are the governor is personally requiring them to step up. Yeah, I would think so. Hello, hundreds of millions of dollars at stake here. This was an ambitious plan, Rhode Island to be maybe the exclusive state in America where all that you need from government would be there at one or two clicks on your computer. I hate it when a liberal program so well-meaning blows up like this. We all pay the price for lack of efficiency and competency, and this has got to get done toot sweet. This will test the governor's mettle as she has been tested and not done so well on some big picture issues so far. Uh, we'll see. Uh, moving to the other branch of government in Rhode Island, the House Speakership is finally settled. I think Nick Mattiello thought it was settled anyway. The headline here is that Steve Frias has conceded to Nick Mattiello. Frias is the Republican challenger in District 15 who took it right down to the wire, won on the secret ballots, meaning the ones that you cast on Election Day, and uh, lost on the mail ballots. Finally, after the recount and the recount and the recount, it's about, I don't know, 85 votes or so that separated he and the speaker. The speaker, cool, calm, and collected about all of it. 
Well, it's, it's just part of the process, and uh, I, I've, I've learned to accept that. It, it, was, it was a close race, so, um, you know, I, I, I certainly understood his desire for a recount. Uh, now that the recount is over, I'm glad we're moving forward. Yeah, I'm guessing he is. Listen, you got to thank Steve Fries for running this race. Uh, he gave the speaker all he could handle. I know there's been a lot of media criticism about the Republican Party and the chairperson, Brendan Bell, and his feeling almost exclusive. If people feel like it's an exclusive focus on this race to the detriment of others. Um, but the race itself and the candidacy forces Nick Mattiello to some conservative fiscal policies, some of which he has and some of which he needs to execute, including but not limited to the car tax reduction that he pulled out of the air during this campaign. So that race is a winning race for the Republicans and Steve Frias, even though he didn't win on the board. And uh, finally, in Cranston, you know, I read this story today in the paper and said, wow, I forgot that they don't have one, meaning a woman. First time a woman will become a firefighter in the city of Cranston. And I don't have anything really profound to say about this other than to just say, is that not a long, long time coming? It's, uh, it's amazing. I guess my only message would be to the firefighters, those young guys there, and the rest of the rank and file, uh, keep your head straight. It's 2016 heading into 2017. No shenanigans. Don't need the aggravation, right? Just saying. It's kind of an old boy network sometimes. Heroes, but old boy. Good for her. Alrighty. Uh, the minority leader, in a conversation that we recorded yesterday for scheduling purposes, will join us when we come back. Stay with us. All righty, welcome back. Patricia Morgan, the state representative and new minority leader, is my guest. And it has been an election season mm. to remember, huh? It was an active one. What's yes. your overall gut check from the whole thing? I think the presidential election, unfortunately, took all of the oxygen, mm. right? Um, Where so were that you? I don't, I don't ever remember checking in on you on that. Were you with Trump? Um, you know what? I'm still a hard question to answer, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I'm very supportive of the president-elect. I'm hopeful that he will bring about the change that our, our country needs. And I really do believe that we had gone way too far to the left and had forgotten working families. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that he will bring jobs back and he will do he address some of the things that are really hurting our country right now. I'm supportive. I want him to do well. Were you with him prior to? From the beginning, no, I no. wasn't. No. Who was your candidate? Um, I liked Kasich. Yeah, I think a lot of Rhode Island Republicans felt more uncomfortable with, with Kasich, but uh, it has been a whirlwind. Were you up all night watching? I fell asleep. <laughs> yeah, Did I mean, you? it's too long of a night. I mean, you know, we were, that was the end of my campaign as right. well, so a long couple of days, so I sat down to watch it and woke up while he was giving his victory speech. So, congratulations. How many, how many, terms now is this for you this will be my fourth you're a veteran now I'm a veteran that's you're, right you're a seasoned veteran and you became the minority leader in a palace coup or was it just by evolution I you know um, Brian Newberry said he didn't want to do it anymore that's right I think I just made the case to my caucus members about what my leadership would be um, what my goals were for us as Republicans going forward and it was compelling well, look, you have been the most vocal, gutsy, out there, 11 feet on the 10-foot board, oftentimes Republican. We have lamented, and I have chastised your peers for not supporting you on some things. Um, they will whisper behind the scenes, not for attribution, that you are gutsy, but unreliable, sometimes off the reservation. Uh, tough to deal with behind the scenes and all that kind of thing and I end up just harumphing. I say, well, you know what? She's the only one that's got the rocks. So how do you evaluate that whole dynamic? Um, you know, you understand what I, when I say that. Sure. They think sometimes that you don't play ball very well. I play ball just fine. Yeah. Um, well. You know, we're a group of, of 11 
uh, strong people and everybody's got their opinion. Um, I actually stepped forward with the Republican policy group and took on, I think, some issues that needed to be discussed. People don't even know there is one, a Republican policy, policy group. group. Who's in it? Um, so it is inside the caucus and the membership can change de depending on the, the topic that we're studying. We did the convention center authority first because that's a very wasteful, poorly managed entity, authority. Um, it's taking, this year it took over $27 million from taxpayers to keep itself going. Inflated salaries, inflated payrolls, um, not very well run. My opinion, we, ran, we, we studied it, we got the documents, we pulled the documents from them, and we issued a, a report hoping that there would be changes because that can be something that helps our economy. The, the, the convention center can really be kind of something that helps our economy grow. And I think it can do better. We also took on the tolls. Right. So it can be, you know, the membership changes depending on people's um, interest in the topic. We intend to use that going forward. Well, we'll talk about the politics. It's like an oversight committee we'll from the Republican perspective. We'll talk about the politics of the Republican Party a little bit later on. Let's, let's, since you mentioned tolls. I don't think a lot of people understand where we are with that whole thing right now. In fact, I'm not so sure the Democratic leadership understands where we are with that whole thing right now. We have a couple of um, uh, almost token sample test run tolls scheduled for the, for, for the end of next year, I believe. And then 18 is kind of the day or the year that everything kind of rolls in. Supposedly. Supposedly. It feels very fluid. It feels very hard to follow. I, I'm yeah, not sure I that there's a right. sense of confidence that, that supports the whole thing. I think some of the things that you've done have, have, have appropriately, uh, and others uh, have done, uh, have appropriately shaken, uh, appropriately shaken confidence in the plan. Uh, where, where do you it think it should be shaken. So where do you think this whole thing is? I think that they are busy borrowing the money now. Um, I think they are busy with their PR experts trying to make out that if you fill a pothole, it's part of roadworks. Um, but I, I do believe that with the change in federal administrations, that there will be some changes. Um, you know, I, I think there's an infrastructure bill that's coming through that President-elect Trump is suggesting that may do away with our need for tolls. I also believe that maybe this new administration will not be embracing tolls as a as a solution to infrastructure at problems. the same time Donald Trump's sending all sorts of signals it's hard to know you know he reportedly wants a huge infra you know you know darn near trillion dollar yeah, infrastructure that plan that's toll based uh, you know what I don't know I don't know that it marries up to this particular project but he he's on another stratosphere talking about something and the Democrats in Washington are trying to marry him on that and see where he is on that this toll program and roadworks it's got its own context it seems to me it's got its own context and honestly uh, uh, president-elect Trump has only been there four weeks three weeks so it's hard to know what what he's going to propose He's but is your, your instinct is telling you, your instinct but is my, my gut is that our roadworks, our borrowing tolling plan has to go through a lot of obstacles before it becomes actually operational. Like? Litigation from the American Trucking Association. That's a Rhode lock. Island Trucking Association. That's a lock. That's happening. But the, the, the problem and, is. And also it's then the federal control over. I mean, they're actually going to be tolling overpasses and underpasses, not bridges in, in the, what, Right. There's no bridges. It's underpasses. It's just highways. It's highways. They're just going to... You know, 146 over Middle Spring Avenue is now a bridge. Who knew? Who you knew? Know I mean? exactly. Right. So, so, <laughs> right? Who knew? So I think they're still... So they got to put them up for the, uh, for the Truckers Association to litigate. They can't sue without damage. So they, some of these test toll plazas have got to go up before we get some reconciliation. Right. And right. in the end, we're going to get a ruling. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. We're going to get a ruling from a judge that says trucks can't be identified they and can't isolated. They can't be out. And That's then we're right. going to get right back to the, oh, man, we're committed to this whole thing, so your car and my car will have to be told 
at some kind of proportion and, level. And we really need to have do whatever we can to stop that. I mean, in the final analysis, it comes out of average Rhode Islanders' wallets. All of this money, it's not like this money just falls from the sky or there's a, a hole in, in the back of the state house we just go and, and, and shovel it out of, right? Yeah. This is coming out of average Rhode Islanders' wallets, no matter how you look at it, whether it's tolls or whether it's an increased fee here or something. The Trucking Association is not going to pay for this. We pay for this. And we need to find cheaper, better, more efficient ways to maintain our roads and bridges. All right, when we come back, we'll talk about what the, uh, the agenda is for the Republican group. Small but feisty. Stay with us. So what would be the major agenda the Republicans have for the 2017 year? We're honestly going to be looking at a bunch of, of topics that deal with average families. You know, we all just had an election, so we went door to door and we were really talking to folks. And it's clear that average families, just everyday Joes, they're really feeling the strain. Uh, property taxes, the cost of living, all these things. Um, and kind of regulations and the encroachment of government upon their lives. Most people just want to be left alone, right? Um, so we are going to be choosing uh, topics that really address some of the, the problems they're having. We can't address them all. There's 11 of us, right? But we are going to be shining light uh, you know, on, on different, different okay. topics. Well, let's talk about the 11 of you. It's, it's 10 and then Blake Philippi came mm -hmm. back from independent status to, to become a Republican. You lost some veterans in, in the flow here. Um, yeah, they retired. Yeah, so, uh, but there's an editorial in the Providence Journal yesterday uh, regarding Brandon Bell, uh, the gregarious state Republican Party chairperson, a role that you have played, and I thought played pretty well when you did it, um, beating the tar out of him for what they perceive to be a failure of growing the party and making the mistake of throwing a lot of eggs in the Mattiello basket, meaning the House Speaker, uh, with the Steve Frias race. What was your take on that editorial? Uh, you know, it was it was tough. It was tough on Brandon. Um, pathetic. You know, they called him pathetic. Listen, being the chairman party of the pathetic. Republican Party in Rhode Island is a tough job. Sure. And you're right. I did it once before, so I am not going to. I'm not going to criticize because it's tough. It's clear we can do better. The party should do better. Um, we need to do better with our fundraising, candidate recruitment. All those things are true. We need to. We need to support our candidates better. We need to. I, I, um, and we have been, you know, I've been working for several cycles now trying to build some kind of infrastructure around candidates. One of the good things that people should know, well, let me just give you some statistics. In a presidential year, we actually did the, the data crunching. 31% more people voted in the presidential year than in an off year. 31%. That's a huge number of extra bodies coming in to vote. And most, many of those bodies aren't paying attention to local politics. They came because it was the presidential election. So, so right away we're dealing with that influx of, of voters who aren't necessarily looking at state issues. But one of the really good things I think that's good for Republicans is in 2012, the Republican candidates who were not supported by the party or this infrastructure that we're building, they got 36% of the vote statewide on average. That average now is 49%. So we've made a huge improvement in the supports that we give to our, our, our candidates and we're learning how to do it better. So I am hoping that in the next cycle, which is what, 2018, we will have gotten it to the point where we can get people over the, over the hump. Um, because mm. our state will be better if we have more Republicans in the State House, and I'm not saying that just because I'm a Republican, but because you need you need, the argument. You, you need a variety of, of, yeah. of opinions. We, but we've done this for a long time. I, you know, I, I feel like I'm blue in the face repeating the same mantra year after year after year after year. But only, I've been around here long enough to be able to say I've been saying this for a long time. I don't know why the Republicans, I don't know why you guys follow this same model that the Democrats do. The idea that, I mean, they're, they're going after Brandon Bell in this op-ed piece, really, really tough. Mm -hmm. And look, you know, yeah, I, he's working for a living. Yes. 
He's an attorney. Yep. You work for a living. Mm -hmm. You know, the chairperson has been a volunteer, part-time, dedicated, but but I think ham, hamstrung individual. You guys have got to figure out a different model. You got to go raise a couple hundred thousand dollars to staff a full-time operation yes. there and change the way you're doing business. You can't do this. No. You know, stupidity is knocking your head against the wall thinking you're going to get some kind of result no, that's I, I, different. And you, actually, I've been saying this for 15 years here. You've, you've said exactly what the problem is. It is fundraising. You have to fundraise. And it's hard to do in a Democrat state. I mean, we're one of the bluest of the blue you states, right? You need a professional right? so fundraising finding, effort. Um, and you've got to we've compensate tried that somebody to be able I'm, to get it done. I'm, I'm telling you, we've tried all of the normal ways of, of raising money. But that is where the issue is. We have to raise money because we do need a full-time staff. Yeah. You do. A, a volunteer chairman cannot do it Can't by themselves. Can't do it. So he went after the head. He went after Speaker Mattiello. The problem with the politics is, is that Speaker Mattiello versus the progressive left that's crawling up his wazoo right now um, is, is more... Is more akin to what your issues are. I mean, look, you don't like the Turk toll. I mean, you could PR off a bunch of problems sure. you have with Mattiello, the corruption issues that surrounded him. I don't think no, he's, he's corrupt. No, he's more business friendly. He, he absolutely is. So this is morphing thing going on. Even if Steve Frias had beaten Nick Mattiello, the question becomes, well, who's going to run the joint, mm -hmm. right? Right. So it was almost to be careful what you ask for type of thing. <laughs> yes. True? Yeah, true. Absolutely um, true. But, you know, money, money quarterbacking is one thing. But for I, me, it's we need to grow our caucus. That's, you know, that's kind of what my goal is, to just grow us. Because if we're a larger number, then we don't have to worry about what you said, the progressives having too large of a, of a say in that, in that room, right? I then we can have a more business-friendly, average family-friendly yeah. environment. Yeah. You get to that number near 20, all of a sudden yep. you've got some power. Then you've got some power and, and the, the ability to move legislation. By the way, what happened with that, that Mattiello race with Frias and Shauna Lawton, who ran against Frias? You supported Lawton, said she was here first. I get all that. That's just the end. Why, 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 why did she send out that flyer? Uh, why, why can't she clean up her part of this whole thing? I mean, did, did you yeah. instruct her on how to handle that whole thing? No, honestly, I haven't spoken to her since the primary, the end of the primary. I called, I, I stayed neutral through the primary, right? It was two Republicans well, that were running. You, I you, stayed absolutely neutral. Well, no, wait a second. You, you supported Lot and you recruited her. Uh, she came to me in, in March. And she was Frias the only one in the race, in so you, I helped you, her. And you did what? You backed off is what you're I saying? I totally backed off. And okay. then when she lost, I called her to make sure she was okay. I don't know. I don't know where she went. I'm sorry. She, listen, she's a novice. She's naive. I don't think she understood what she was getting into. It's a dirty game. It's a tough game. It's a blood sport in Rhode Island. Hmm. We'll leave it there, I guess, right? Yeah. All right. We'll come back often. We'll see how your agenda goes. Congratulations, Minority Leader. Thank you. All right. Final word and we come back. Stay with us. Listen, I think I should probably offer the respect to name the Cranston firefighter who has broken through that glass ceiling. She's Rebecca Lima, formerly of the Central Falls Fire Department, I believe. Uh, I just felt bad at the top of the show that, hey, we had lived this thing. What can I tell you? But she should, we have a picture of her, don't we? There we are. Congratulations to the first female firefighter in Cranston. Uh, another breakthrough. Cuba, Fidel Castro. He's gone. What does it mean? Local expertise on that tomorrow night on Dan York State of Mind. Don't forget to tune in to the radio at 3 o'clock on WPRO. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.